All right, everyone, good day today. We'll be talking today about Chapter 7 in your textbook, Delivering Healthcare in America, a Systems Approach, looking at the 7th edition. And in Chapter 7 today, we'll be talking about where healthcare happens, being the outpatient in primary care services. Really important information to understand if you're going to be working in healthcare. As a reminder, this supplementary lecture is to support your textbook reading, which should always be primary in order to support your writings and discussion uh, in future PowerPoint assignments. And also, I will say that this lecture should help you to brainstorm and generate ideas and responses for your writing as well. And so with that being said, let us move on. I'll say that this is a longer chapter. There are 34 slides here, so there will be some areas where I go into detail, maybe even speak uh, to current information on it, but there'll be some areas where you'll definitely need to dig down deeper um, to build your own understanding. And so let's talk about our learning objectives. Um, obviously, we want to understand the difference between outpatient, ambulatory, and primary care. We want to understand some of the principles behind patient-centered medical homes and community-based primary care. We'll talk a little bit about the reasons for the dramatic growth in outpatient services, which should be obvious if you look at today's demographics. We'll talk about the various types of outpatient settings and services that can be offered. We'll talk about the role of complementary in alternative medicine and why those are utilized by patients. We'll compare and contrast to the primary care delivery in other countries, and we'll talk about the goal of the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, on primary care and what specifically was accomplished and maybe what wasn't accomplished yet. And so let's kind of get going in terms of introduction, point of clarification, the terms outpatient and ambulatory, those are often used interchangeably, so please always keep that in mind for future discussions. Also know that hospitals historically have provided the majority of outpatient care for patients, and this is because independent providers are really going to be constrained in their ability to do so, basically due to capital restraints or constraints. Um, and then of course, as the current population ages and gets older and older, we see that consumer demand can fuel the growth for not just medicine, but also complementary and alternative medicine as well. And then, of course, the goal of the ACA was to address access for the poor and the vulnerable, and they were successful in some areas and not successful in others, which isn't surprising. That usually happens with healthcare legislation in general. And so what is outpatient care? Well, these are outpatient services, or as we said earlier, ambulatory care. And so ambulatory care is the diagnostic and therapeutic services for what they call the walking patient. This is used uh, synony synonymously with community medicine. And then outpatient services are services that are not provided with an overnight stay. Right? The reimbursement system for inpatient versus outpatient stays is going to be very different and so the services provided will also vary as well. And so what is the scope of outpatient services? Well primary care is the foundation right for ambulatory health services. If the patient needs or wants any other services other than primary care that is going to be an integral part of outpatient services and of course technology always allows for treatments to be be provided in ambulatory settings as well. Make sure you look at Table 7.1 in the textbook, which talks about the different owners and providers and settings for ambulatory care. All right, so primary care. This plays probably the biggest role, and according to the textbook, the central role in the healthcare delivery system. This is very different from your secondary and tertiary uh, delivery systems do well in duration and frequency and in intensity the secondary and tertiary care they're going to be much more complex much more specialized usually much more chronic uh, much more costly and um, hopefully short and stay but sometimes can be long depending on the condition secondary care like we said is usually shorter term um, sporadic in nature 
can often include either hospitalization or surgery, require some type of specialty consultation, sometimes by multiple specialists working um, as a team, and often requires rehabilitation before the patient can go back to receiving mainly primary care services. Now tertiary care, this is a smaller percentage of patients and this is the most complex level of care. This is usually for very uncommon conditions or I would argue repeatedly chronic conditions, what healthcare providers may call frequent flyers. This will be institutional based, so think of like a long-term care facility within a hospital. Um, very specialized, very driven by technology. In fact, there'll be very few patients in these areas where there's probably just as much machines and equipment as there are patients and often rendered in very large teaching hospitals obviously due to the opportunity for physicians and other healthcare providers to learn these more rare conditions. So what's the frequency of these healthcare services amongst these three settings? Well for primary care it's about 75 to 85 percent of the population requiring only primary services about 10 to 12 percent will require secondary care and about 5 to 10 percent being tertiary care. And so um, as normal we always talk about the World Health Organization definitions and understandings um, because as technology grows globalism becomes more and more important and so it's always important to take the WHO definition into consideration and so when they look at primary care they talk about three different elements, one being the point of entry, two the coordination, and three what they call essential care. And then we have the definition of primary care according to the Institute of Medicine. And so this definition includes um, the comprehensive addressing of any health care problems really over any stage of a patient's life, the coordination of services, uh, to meet the patient's needs, continuity of care over time, and also having not just accessibility for the patient, but also accountability on those who are providing health care as well. Looking at primary care in the ACA, there are four primary care provisions that came with the ACA. And we talked a little bit about this in previous chapters, but one being increased Medicare and Medicaid pay payments, though not all states took part in that, Texas being one who did not. There were new incentives for primary care workers working in underserved areas. Again, this worked in some areas, but not in others. And in some areas where it did work, it actually increased cost. Uh, the third primary care provision under the ACA was the expansion of the health center program and the strengthening of capacity for certain health care centers. Again, successful in some areas, not successful in others, and then the creation of additional training programs so that we can learn from mistakes made in the past and provide better health care. And so what are the new directions in primary care? One of them is what they call patient-centered medical homes. And so this is more of a team-oriented approach to provide uh, special needs children who require constant care coordination it consists of a multi or interdisciplinary team of physicians and other allied health professionals to manage and uh, work for the patient. And uh, early studies are demonstrating that there is a positive impact. Um, of course, the question is always what are the costs associated and are they manageable long term? And I think that still uh, is yet to be determined. And of course, there's various uh, assessment tools that are used in this new setting. Continuing um, our conversation in new directions for primary care, we can talk about and look at community oriented primary care. And so some of the things that are being focused on here are reducing exclusion and social disparities, trying to organize the health services around people's needs, and I, I would say here probably being proactive as opposed to reactive, looking at integrating health into all sectors, looking at collaborative models, not just in terms of healthcare, but having dialogue around policy and increasing stakeholder participation being the patient or the caregivers for those patients if they are unable to advocate for themselves. 
So let's talk about primary care providers. As we looked earlier, this is going to be the largest area where medicine happens. And so um, U.S. primary care is not restricted just to physicians. Remember, we talked a couple of chapters ago about the different uh, non-physician practitioners, such as nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and what they call certified nurse midwives. And also remember that primary care also includes internal medicine, which is basically primary care for people roughly over the age of 40 to 45, pediatrics, and OB-GYN. Now there is a growth in outpatient services, and of course we can see organizations and companies aligning with this. This is due for five reasons, reimbursement, technology, utilization control factors, such as the ones we spoke about in earlier chapters, physician practice factors, um, and social factors. Make sure you take a look at figure 7-2. This talks about the percentages of total surgeries performed in outpatient departments over roughly a 20-year period in U.S. community hospitals. All right, so let's talk about the types of outpatient care settings as well as the methods of delivery. So obviously we're going to have private practices, but there's also going to be various hospital-based services, right? Hospitals do a lot more than just having patients stay overnight or do surgeries. There's clinical services. Obviously, surgical services, uh, emer emergency medicine is going to be big, a big part of it. Uh, a lot of home health care services originate out of here, and many women's services are conducted or headquartered out of here. Make sure you take a look at figure 7.3, which gives you um, a good graphic on the types of outpatient care settings and the methods of delivery as well. And so... Just talking about some of those types of outpatient care settings, there's freestanding facilities. And of course, you probably see a lot of these in your communities, just your basic walk-in clinic. We see a rapid growth of urgent care centers. Um, probably noticed a lot of these during the COVID pandemic. Various types of uh, really kind of quick surge centers, as they call them. Um, retail clinics. And then, of course, we see a lot of mobile medical and diagnostic screenings. And if you remember from our earlier chapter, uh, mobile medicine is one of the great things um, about providing healthcare globally into a lot of third world nations. I think Mercy Ships would be a great example of mobile medicine or these um, giant RVs that you see that are mobile in communities to really increase access for mammograms and screenings. All right, continuing our conversation of outpatient care settings and methods of delivery, we have home health care services and then hospice services. And so hospice is going to be a comprehensive service for the terminally ill or those with a very short life expectancy of six months or less. Uh, palliation, which is basically uh, pain management, psychosocial and spiritual support. These services often come with hospice. You'll see a lot of people who during hospice time, a lot of these services will be provided by a chaplain who then will perform um, afterlife services for the patient and the family. And of course, there are specific conditions for this in order to be certified by Medicare for reimbursement. Again, lots of figures in this chapter. Take a look at figure 7-6, looking at the demographic characteristics of U.S. home health care patients for 2013. Look at figure 7-7 seven, seven, that talks about the estimated payments for home health care according to various sources. And then look at figure 7-4 that will talk about home health care and hospice care patients served um, by agency type and number of patients. This data is around 2007. All right, so continuing our conversation for um, types of outpatient care settings and methods of delivery. We also have ambulatory long care services, and so these are going to include nursing homes, case management, adult day health care, um, also going to include public health services, and many community health centers. Some are funded uh, by local state governments, and some are funded at a national level by the federal government. So there are three characteristics of free clinics. You may see some of these. Uh, these services are provided either at no charge or very low charge. Um, the clinic is usually 
not directly supported or operated by a government agency, though sometimes there can be indirect influence. And then services are usually delivered um, by a trained volunteer uh, staff member. And you might have different physicians sometimes that will rotate in and out and do a day or two there, but I'd say 95% of the services and operations are usually done by volunteers. And of course, there are other clinic types. And then during due to the COVID pandemic, we see a rapid rise in telephone access and Zoom consultations as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about complementary and alternative medicine, also known as CAM. Why, why would patients want to um, seek these alternative methods? Well, there's, there's some good reasons. Uh, a lot of them um, feel like their Western treatments haven't helped, right? There's a, definitely a big influence uh, from Eastern medicine and mysticism. And so if you feel like you're not getting help with Western methods, I think the perception is it couldn't hurt you to try something else. Um, Sometimes it can be fear-based, right, or concern. They want to really avoid or maybe even delay a complex surgery, or they want to not have a treatment that they may have experienced as being toxic in the past. The patients can definitely feel in control and more empowered um, using CAM methodologies. Um, you know, one of the things that I often hear physicians tell patients is, please don't Google. But, um, you know, Googling um, medical and health-related information can help patients feel empowered. And through that research, they often find complementary and alternative medicine resources. And quite honestly, um, with the rising cost in healthcare and the decline in providers in some areas, providers are having to see more and more patients a day, uh, turn and burn, as I've heard them say. And so many patients just want a healthcare provider to take the time to listen to them and to be present. That's why bedside manner and physician and healthcare training is so important. But this can ultimately lead to the pursuit of CAM uh, medicine. Continuing our conversation on complementary and alternative medicine, we have the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine, and they have uh, organized and created uh, several objectives. The first is to uh, make sure that they do pursue these, but do it in the context of rigorous science. It's very easy to find an alternative medicine that does not do so, and so they seek to make sure that they are respected through their use of science. Uh, to have, secondly, training uh, in complementary and alternative medicine standards and researchers, and then to find more effective ways to disseminate uh, information to the public and to healthcare professionals, and my assumption would be to have some type of uniformity and standards in that communication as well. All right, so let's talk about the utilization of outpatient services. Uh, we talked a lot about what they are. How do they get utilized? Well, when we look at the uh, visits to physicians, we see that for uh, physicians that are in general or family practice, that's going to be about 22.8%. For physicians in internal medicine, and remember internal medicine usually older to middle-aged patients, 13.6%. PEDS a little bit above 11%. OBGYNs about 6.5%. And DOs, as we talked about earlier, which are similar yet different from MDs, about 6.7%. You can also see... Um, charts for the utilization of outpatient, outpatient services in your books in Table 7, 5, and 7, 6. And so what does primary care look like in other countries? Well, in the UK, they provide, um, I think, what some would argue as being more comprehensive in terms of coverage with little to no patient cost or sharing. However, they do have some of the longest wait times, and so... If you have a family history, for example, of maybe a certain type of cancer, uh, I think the fear for some patients is by the time it is identified, if you have to wait 12 months before you can see a provider, uh, could the cancer not have progressed so far if you could have seen that provider earlier? So anytime there's a change in healthcare, uh, for every advantage, there can sometimes be a disadvantage as well. Canada, uh, very similar to UK in terms of being more so, uh, more socialistic in nature. Their um, primary care does cover physician visits, 
but medication coverage can vary. And then, um, as we've talked about in earlier chapters, Australia, New Zealand, Germany are also examples similar to the UK and Canada, but not quite because there is a uh, more and varying degree of cost sharing for the patients. And so we talked about this in previous chapters, having uh, co-pays or co-insurance. Um, when patients have a higher percentage of cost ownership, we find a, util a decrease in the utilization of healthcare services. Continuing our conversation of primary care in other countries, it's also um, noted that in Australia, Canada, France, Germany, Switzerland, and the United States, payers often use fee-for-service payments, although as we've learned in the text already, fee-for-service was much more common and at a higher percentage in years past than it is today. And these countries at various levels also employ uh, performance incentives. I know that in organizations I have worked for in the past, there are incentives, certain healthcare incentives that would decrease um, the insurance cost to patients if they did certain things like working out, not smoke, have a healthy body weight, have healthy cholesterol levels, those types of things. Uh, primary care is mostly privatized, and at least to some degree in all countries mentioned except Iceland and Sweden, according to the text. And so, in conclusion, some main points, keep these in mind for your writing assignments and for your post. Ambulatory services are increasing outside of the hospital setting. Um, ambulatory services transcend basic and routine primary care services. We talked about that in some detail. Um, primary care has become uh, interestingly more specialized. There are numerous outpatient services emerging and there's a variety of settings for services that have developed and most likely will continue to develop. And so that's all for this chapter. I hope it um, helped to facilitate your learning and will help to create some thinking and, um, and some work for your future writing assignments. And uh, I look forward to learning your insights from your writings.